Greetings, brethren. Welcome to the Day of Atonement 2023. And it's one of the most important holy days that we have. And it is a day in which God commands us to fast. And also, a very specific concerning the timing of the day. And this is why it is so important. This is not one of these things that we can take for granted, but one of the most solemn holy days of the year. Not only involves us in the church, but it also involves the world. So let's come to Leviticus 23. And let's pick it up here in verse 26. Now remember, though Moses wrote these words, God spoke them. So whenever we read the words of God, especially when he is quoted, that is the voice of the Lord and we are to obey the voice of the Lord. Now, verse 26, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of the seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation to you, and you shall afflict your souls. That means to fast. No food, no water. Now, the reason that is so is so that we realize that everything physical that we have comes from God. Just like Paul said in Acts 17, that in God we live and move and have our being. Everyone in the world, whether they know God or not. So that's why it's important that we fast on this day because it also involves sin. It involves our personal sins, as we will see. And it also involves the sins of Satan, the devil, against us. And that's why it's such a very important day. To make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. That means God's blessing is removed. And whoever does any work in that same day, that same one I will destroy from among his people. A fervor of further penalty for working on this day. Any work. You shall do no manner of work. It is a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of rest, you shall afflict yourselves in the ninth day of the month at sunset. Now that's Ba'erev. That ends the day. So this is when atonement begins. Whenever the sun goes down below the horizon, okay, that ends the day. And immediately that time right after the sun has set, becomes Ba'erev between the two evenings, between sunset and dark. Now, the Jews had different ways of calculating the Sabbath, but God has it very specific. And this ninth month at even to the, uh, from sunset to sunset, you shall keep your Sabbath. That applies to all Sabbaths. 
because that's how God calculates the time. We find in Leviticus 16 that we're to bring an offering, quite a few offerings in Leviticus 16, and this becomes very important because it is a special instruction beginning with the high priest for all the priests, all the Levites, all the people. And this is why we bring an offering. We don't come before God on these special holy days without an offering. So at this time, we'll go ahead and take a pause and we will take up an offering. Now let's continue on with the Day of Atonement. And the whole chapter of Leviticus 16 is a detailed account on what was done at the temple for the Day of Atonement. And Day of Atonement is Yom Kippur, which means a day of covering. So let's begin here, Leviticus 16 and verse 1. And again, you see the explicit instructions. Now remember this. Remember how important that the whole temple area was and then you get into the holy place and then the holy of holies. And when the tabernacle was set up in the first month of the second year after they came out of Egypt, then God devoured the offering that was there on the altar. And the command was that that fire was to always be kept burning because that came from God. And then the two sons of Aaron, when they were supposed to be watching and putting the wood on the fire, they let it go out. And then they started another fire, which was just taken from ordinary fire and not what God sent down to, to start the fire. God intended that fire to be from him continuously all through time that they could always say, this is the fire of God. So God executed the two sons of Aaron because they didn't follow the instructions. So all of these instructions in Leviticus 16 are very important. And again, We'll start out in verse 1, and we'll go through this, and we'll see everything, and we will see what all of it means. Verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, speak to Aaron your brother that he does not come at all times into the sanctuary within the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, so that he does not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. Now, I want you to think on this for just a minute. In the covenant with Israel, only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. And God put his presence there in that day, special presence, 
His presence was always there. And that was called the Shanaka. And when Aaron went in, it was only once a year. But today, under the covenant of eternal life, we have access to God the Father every single day through prayer. And then couple that with Bible study. And how important all of this is. Aaron shall come into the sanctuary this way, with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Now that was for him, because he represented to all the people God. And he was the only one who had access to God one day a year. And he could not approach it without having first a sin offering. Verse 4, he shall put on the holy linen coat. He shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh. He shall be girded with a linen girdle. And with a linen mitre, he shall be dressed. These are holy garments, and he shall wash his flesh in water and put them on. Now then, think about the New Testament. We are to have the righteous holy garments, right? And when we come into the presence of God, on that sea of glass when the resurrection has been completed, we're all going to be appropriately dressed because we're going to meet God. Now think about that. Okay. Then here's special instruction. Verse 5. He shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering, one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock for a sin offering, which is for himself and make an atonement for himself and for his house. Now we are going to see that for a complete atonement, there are two parts. And that's why we have this ceremony. Now here's further instructions what he was to do. Verse 7. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots on the two goats. One lot for the Lord, the other lot for Azazel. That's where a lot of difficulty comes for a lot of people in understanding. And most of the commentaries that you read, and please understand this, the reason that they don't comprehend it properly is because they don't keep the Sabbath and holy days of God. And they don't understand that there are two parts to the atonement. We'll cover that. That's what we need to understand. And he shall cast the lots. Okay. Now why do that? The reason is men do not know right from wrong, good from evil. They can't tell the difference between the true God and Satan. So in order for God to show that there are two parts to atonement, one, to atone for the people, and two, to put all the sins of Satan upon him, represented by the Azazel goat. Now we'll see that 
in a little bit. Let's go on. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for his Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it, not for it, on it. And shall send it away into the wilderness for Azazel. Now, this does not mean another, another name for Christ as scapegoat. This directly means for Satan the devil, as we will see. And Aaron shall bring the young bullock for a sin offering and shall offer it for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house and shall kill the young bull for a sin offering which is for him. And he shall take a censer full of coals from the fire off the altar before the Lord, and his hand full of, of fragrant incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, and the cloud of the incense shall cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony or the Ark of the Covenant, and he shall not die. Now, so special was this, that if the high priest did not do it right, histoire, he's gone. So what the Jews did, they tied a rope around the high priest. So that if God struck him dead, they could pull him up. Now after he does that, and he shall take the blood of the young bull and shall sprinkle with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward, and shall sprinkle at the front of the mercy seat seven times from the blood with his fingers. Now, that's the only time that blood was applied in the Holy of Holies. So that's how special this day is. Now after he did that, then he would come out, verse 15, then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and shall bring its blood inside the veil. So he made the trip out. He offered the goat, took the blood, and went back into the Holy of Holies. And he shall do with the blood as he did with the blood of the young bull and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the sanctuary because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all of their sins. Now mark that, all of their sins. See, All the sins that the people made of themselves. That covers for their sins. And Kippur means to cover. It also means, as we will see, to ransom. Let's continue on. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation, which remains with them in the midst of their uncleanness. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goes in to make atonement in the sanctuary until he comes out and has made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. So that forgave and covered all their sins, beginning with the high priest, 
then the Levites, then the people. Now then, here's where the difficulty comes, and it's hard for people to understand. But you see, there are sins this way. Sins that we do of our own volition and sins that we do which Satan the devil has caused us to do. Now then, we see how God has taken care of the sin for human beings. But then the greater sin is what Satan does. So God lays all the sins that he caused all the people to do, which were in addition to the sins that they chose to do, back on this goat for Azazel. Verse 20, and when he made an end of reconciling the sanctuary and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the sins of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send it away by the hand of a chosen man into the wilderness. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities to a land in which no one lives. And he shall let the goat go in the wilderness. Now then, that's quite a ceremony. Why do that? Well, because these are all the sins that Satan has caused. Okay? Now, let's look at something else concerning the word kapoor. Kapoor can also mean Ransom. And ransom is quite a very important thing. Okay? Now, let's investigate this a little further, and then we'll come back to Leviticus 16 a little later. Let's begin here in Proverbs 6, 35. Okay? Proverbs 6.35. Now then, this talks about a sin of adultery. And whenever there is sin going after other gods, that is called spiritual adultery. Okay. So let's pick it up, Proverbs 6 and verse 32. Whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does it destroys his own soul sooner or later, and it affects the conscience. And whenever there are sex acts like that, those are recorded in the mind. He shall get a wound and dishonor, and his shame shall not be wiped away. Now then, that is, if he doesn't repent of it. However, for the husband of the woman that he committed adultery with, it says here, for jealousy is the rage of a man, therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance, and he will not accept any recompense, any atonement, because the word here is kapoor. Same word for atonement. 
In other words, that breach of the marriage is not reconcilable. Nor will he be willing if you multiply gifts for him. I want you to think about how bad the world is today with all these satanic sexual sins going on. Okay? Now, let's take a look at this again. Let's come to Proverbs 21. Okay? Very interesting. No ransom. Okay? Proverbs 21, and let's begin in verse 18. Verse 18, Proverbs 21. The wicked shall be a ransom for the righteous and the transgressor for the upright. Now look at that again. The wicked shall be a ransom for the righteous. Now, ransom can also mean because all the sins of the wicked will be laid on them. Okay. No ransom or atonement. And a transgression for the upright. Okay. Now, let's come to Isaiah, the 43rd chapter, and let's look at what God says. And this will help give us a greater understanding of why the sins were pronounced on Azazel. Isaiah 43 and verse 3. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, or atonement. Now, this is something we haven't covered before. But I got a phone call from a man in studying out the word Kapoor, and he saw that this was a, a tremendous verse. So he called me on the phone, he attends another church of God, so I won't mention his name, and asked me to check it out. Could this also mean that I gave Egypt for your atonement? Now, what was Egypt? Egypt was what? All the sins of Satan, the devil. Now, for God to deal with the children of Israel, he also had to lay upon the Egyptians all their sins. Now, did he do that? And how was that done? That was done through all the plagues. And what was the last plague? The last plague was the killing of the firstborn, of man and beast throughout all of Egypt. But we know that on that Passover night, because of the children of Israel, offered the Passover lamb at each house, and the blood was put on the side post and the upper lintel, that when the destroyer came to destroy the firstborn of Egypt, he would see the blood and he would pass over. So in a sense, that very first Passover also has some of the elements of atonement in it. When you look at the forgiveness of sin for the congregation of Israel, all their sins, they're all forgiven. Once they're all forgiven, they don't need any more forgiveness, right? 
and then laid upon Azazel, who represents Satan, all the sins of Egypt as a ransom or atonement. So let's read verse 3 again. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your atonement. That follows along with what was Azazel. Because we're talking about spiritual sin that Satan locks people into. That sin must be removed. And that can only be removed or God putting it all, all the sins of all the world, of all time, on the Azazel goat, just like the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is for the atonement, as we will see, and forgiveness of our sins before God. And that's why there also has to be baptism, because the old person before calling and conversion and receiving the Holy Spirit, must die the baptismal death in the watery grave. So with atonement and with Passover, it's like one coin with two sides. And we will see that we are rescued from Satan the devil. All right? Okay, Proverbs 21. Let's go over that again. Let's see what it says here. Proverbs 21 and verse 18. The wicked shall be a ransom or atonement for the righteous, and the transgressor for the upright. So what do we have? Egypt, all the firstborn are killed. That's the transgressor, okay? All the sins are of Satan. They remain on him. They are put on him. And in a sense, the children of Israel with the offering of the Passover the, uh, while they were in Egypt, God lifted their sin or covered their sin from them so that he could begin to deal directly with the people of Israel through Aaron and Moses and later the priesthood. Okay. And God dealt directly with them, didn't he? Was he not there in a pillar of the cloud by day and the fire by night? Yes, he was. Okay. So that ties in with Isaiah 43. All right. Now let's look at some other things concerning atonement. There is a price that God has paid for for us. Okay, let's come to 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter. And this represents the goat that was sacrificed on atonement, okay, and also on Passover. All right, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20. Let's go back to verse, verse 19, okay? What? Because Paul is talking about all the sexual sins that were going on and other sins in, in Corinth. And he, he finishes by saying, what? Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is within you from God? 
and you are not your own? See, we need to understand that. Having the Holy Spirit of God is the greatest thing that can happen in our lives until the resurrection. Verse 20, for you were bought with a price. Okay? That price was the death of Jesus Christ and his shed blood and his sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin. And so that opened the way for us to have direct contact with God the Father and Jesus Christ in heaven above. Okay? For you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. See? Now, if we're bought by a price, God owns us. We are his. We are his children. And he also does something else for us, which is very important. Okay? Let's look at it here in Colossians 1. That he delivers us or rescues us from Satan the devil. Now, that's quite a thing, isn't it, huh? Now, he says here, verse 12, Colossians 1. Now, this is quite a thing. I want you to think about this on this Day of Atonement, when we're fasting, when we're praying, when we're coming to God, when we know that he is forgiving our sins, when we know that that great sacrifice of Christ was a tremendous and awesome thing indeed, that God would give up being God to become a human being and only retain just enough of his being of his God existence so that he was God manifested in the flesh and born of Mary and then had every experience in growing up that every human being has so that he could become that sacrifice for the Lord and for the sins of the whole world, but not for the sins of Satan. Giving thanks to the Father was made as qualified for the share of the inheritance of the saints in the light, who has personally rescued us or delivered us. Okay? from the power of darkness and has transferred us under the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption or atonement through his blood, even the remission of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And that means the firstborn from the dead. All right. Now let's come to Acts. 26. Let's see what Paul said about this. See, Because not only are we delivered from our personal sins, we are delivered from Satan the devil and the sins that he perpetrates upon us. Now think of all the sins he's perpetrating on the world right now with all of this satanic sexualization of the world, okay? Now, here is what Paul said. He repeats the words of Christ. Why was he called? Now, we know that he was steeped in Judaism more than any of the other apostles, and there was a reason for that. Okay, let's go ahead and take a break, and we'll come back, and we'll pick it up here at Acts 26. Now let's continue on with the Day of Atonement. Let's come to Acts 26. Paul was 
reiterating the words that Jesus told him when he knocked him to the ground on his way to Damascus, and he was standing trial, so he was explaining how it came about. And he said, after he was knocked to the ground, verse 14, let's see that. Then all of us fell to the ground, all, all the other men there as well, and I heard a voice speak to me, saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Is it hard for you to kick against the pricks? Okay, now that means these big spikes of thorns that if you go against God, you're the same as kicking against those big spikes of thorns and you're just destroying your own life and don't know it. So as he laid on the ground there, he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Now that's an interesting statement, isn't it? Because whenever anyone persecutes us who have the Holy Spirit of God, they are persecuting Jesus. Now think about that. Okay. Verse 16, now arise and stand up on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, for this cause. And as we have covered, God has a purpose for every one of us. God has his purpose that he's fulfilling with the church, his purpose that he is fulfilling with the world, his purpose that he is fulfilling for his eternal plan forever and ever. Okay. For this purpose, to appoint you as a minister and a witness both of what you have seen and what I shall reveal to you. And he revealed, he had to reveal to Saul, the one who became Paul, had to reveal to him that all of the traditional teachings of the Jews were not of God and were not to be a part of the New Testament church. And that includes sacred names. Because as you see, he spoke to Saul in Hebrew. So if God wanted Hebrew names in the New Testament, he would have inspired them to be put in the New Testament, right? Well, he didn't, because this was to go to the whole world, not just to those who knew Hebrew. Verse 17, I'm personally selecting you from among the people and the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes. Who blinds people? We'll see in just a minute. Okay to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light. Who is the power of darkness? Satan the devil. And from the authority of Satan to God, think of that. Now think about Satan's situation today. We'll cover that in just a minute. So that they may receive remission of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified through faith in me. Okay. Now, that was a summary of what he was to do. Okay. Now then, let's look at how Satan works. And Satan does different things. And he wants to come after us. All right? Let's look at the example of Peter. Now, Peter was to become one of the leading apostles. There were actually three of them. Peter, 
and James and John. Let's come here to Mark, the eighth chapter. And let's see that Satan likes to come along and use human effort to introduce sin. So when the choice of sin is made by the individual, that's their sin, but the power behind it is Satan, and that must be accounted for and atoned for and taken care of by God. All right? Acts 8 and verse 30. This is after, right after, right after the vision of transfiguration. Then he strictly charged them that they should tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that it was necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things and to be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, but after three days to rise from the dead. Now then, notice Peter's reaction and notice Jesus' response. And he spoke these words openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Okay. Rebuke Jesus Christ. Now, we don't know all the words that were said, but he probably said, well, Lord, why would you say these things? And then we'll see a little later, he volunteered to die for Jesus. Well, so verse 33, but he turned and looked at his disciples and then rebuked Peter, saying, get you behind me, Satan. Huh. Think of all the battles that were going on spiritually between Christ and Satan and between the disciples and Satan. Okay. Get behind me, Satan, because your thoughts are not on the things of God, but on the things of men. Okay. That is the entrance of Satan the devil. When you get your thoughts on the things of men that are not in accord with God, then that comes up. Okay. Let's come to Luke 22. Let's see another account. Here, Peter was acting as if, boy, he's going to keep Jesus from having to go through all of the difficulties. Okay. No. Let's see it. Let's come here to Luke 22. Okay. And this is right after he gave the bread and the wine. And he said, verse 30, he said to the disciples here concerning what they would receive in the kingdom of God. And I appoint to you as my father has appointed to me a kingdom so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and may sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Verse 31, then the Lord said to Simon, now this tells us what his spiritual battle was going on that we don't know anything about, but this is, gives us a hint of it. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, Listen well. Satan has demanded to have you, to sift you as wheat. Okay? That's why we have to be rescued from Satan the devil. That's part of the Day of Atonement. How is God going to handle all the sins of Satan the devil? Those are not our sins. Those are his sin. What happens to people who do not repent of their sins as well as the sins that Satan made them do? 
they're cast into the lake of fire. Is that not right? That's the second death. Okay. No atonement for them. Then the Lord said, Simon, Simon, listen well. Satan has demanded to have you, to sift you as wheat. Don't know what all of that means, but that must have been something that he was rescued from. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. And he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Now, oh, that was an impetuous statement by him, right? But you see, this tells us this. Many of our thoughts, though we think they are good, are not good thoughts because they're not of God. He was thinking, well, we got to save Jesus. We can't let this happen to him. Okay. Now, verse 34. But he said, I tell you, Peter, the cock shall in no wise crow today, that is in this night, before you have denied knowing me three times. That happened, didn't it? Yes, indeed. Then he had to go out and repent tremendously, right? Okay. Now, let's come back to Romans 5 and verse 11, because this tells us something very important concerning the sacrifice of Christ. Okay. And notice that's just a few verses before chapter 6, where he explains about the whole process and meaning of baptism and being conformed to the sacrifice of Christ. Romans 5, beginning in verse 8. But God commends his own love to us because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more, therefore, having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his own son, much more than having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have received the reconciliation or atonement. Okay? Now, that's why when we go back here, we'll see, let's finish off some things here in Leviticus 16. Let's see the rest of the Azazel because this is important for us to really grasp. God gave his forgiveness and atonement through the sacrifice of, of the goat that was offered and the blood sprinkled on the holy altar of God by the high priest. And this covered or forgave all of our sins. But the goat on whom the live goat fell was a different story. So let's pick that up again. Verse 20, and when he has made an end of reconciling the sanctuary and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Only time there is a live animal. And that's because spirit beings do not die. And Satan, the devil, and the demons are spirit being. That's why the live goat. And wherever the live goat went, wherever Satan went, that's where also all the demons would go as well. 
And it says here of Aaron what he should do with the live goat. He shall lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over him all the sins of the children of Israel. Now, what were those sins? Were those sins not forgiven by the sacrifice of the goat that was to be offered for sin offering and the blood sprinkled on the in the Holy of Holies? Yes, and that covered all their sins. Okay, But all the sins that Satan made people do, all right, all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send it away by the hand of a chosen man into the wilderness. Now we know in the New Testament, it shows that the ultimate judgment of Satan, the devil, and the demons is going to be the blackest darkness forever. And the gold shall bear upon him all their iniquities into a land in which no one lives, and he shall let the goat go. And Aaron shall come to into the tabernacle of the congregation and shall strip off his linen garments, which he had put on when he went into the sanctuary, and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his flesh with water in a holy place. Kind of a type of baptism, right? and put on his garments and come forth and offer his burnt offering and a burnt offering for the people to make atonement for himself and for the people because atonement is to be made one with God. Not just to have your sins forgiven, not to just to have Satan's sins put upon him and removed, but so that we become one with God. To be in his family to be his children, okay? Verse 25, and the fat for the sin offering shall be burned upon the altar, and he that let go the goat for Azazel shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water, and afterward come into the camp. And the young bull for a sin offering and a goat for a sin offering, whose blood you brought in to make atonement in the holy place, they shall carry forth outside the camp, and they shall burn their skins with fire and their flesh and their dung, a complete burning up. And he who burns them shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water, and afterward he shall come into the camp. And it shall be a statute forever, to you in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and shall do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger who is living among you. For on that day an atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you so that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. And it shall be a Sabbath of rest to you and you shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. Okay, now let's look at some other things that the Apostle John wrote concerning sin and Satan. First Epistle of John. And we're going to see some very interesting things concerning sin. Okay, let's first of all start out with how Satan begins to make an inroad. Okay. Eventually, all sins are laid on Satan and the demons, and they are banished to the blackest darkness forever. Okay? We know this, that when Christ and the saints come back to the earth, Revelation 20, the very first thing that happens is an angel a strong angel comes and takes Satan and binds him with a chain and puts him into the abyss. And it is shut and locked up. And Satan has no influence on the people all during the millennium. Okay? 
all during the millennium, there will not be the sins of Satan, the devil. And furthermore, we will find that God in the second resurrection, which also means beginning with the end, with the start of the millennium, that God is going to bring people to repentance. Okay? But let's examine, first of all, the children of God versus the children of Satan. And how Satan comes in first with the sins of the flesh. Okay. First John 2, verse 15. And it's called the way of the world. Do not love the world nor the things that are in the world, for if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. See, because why? What is the love of the Father that we have to have? the love that is with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all of our being, right? That's the love of the Father. And that comes with his spirit. And that comes with our growing and overcoming. And that comes with our living God's way. See? Because everything that is in the world the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pretentious pride of physical life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And who is the God of this world? Satan the devil. And what does he do? He blinds the eyes of those who do not believe. All of that is removed when Satan is locked up, okay? But now we're living in the world, okay? Now then he says in the world, and it's less of the passing away, but the one who does the will of God abides forever, okay? Now then, let's come to chapter three. Let's see how interesting that this is. Now let's pick it up here. In verse 4, okay? Because we're going to see the contrast. And we're going to see the physical sin that we do. And we're also going to see that if we continue in sin, that we become the children of the devil. All right? Everyone who practices sin is also practicing lawlessness. So it's more than just transgression. It's going against law. And the strongest part of it is to hate the law of God. Okay? Lawlessness. And what did Jesus say we would be facing in this time just before his return? Lawlessness shall be what? Multiplied. Amazing. Verse 5. And you know that he appeared in order that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Everyone who dwells in him does not practice sin. We do have our sins and we need to repent. That's true. But we don't practice it as a way of life. Now, how many of those out in the world who today are practicing sins, not only theirs, but reinforced with the power of Satan and the demons? Anyone who practices sin has not seen him, nor has known him. Little children, do not allow anyone to deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Okay? Now, that's what we do. And we stand in the righteousness of God. And that comes through Jesus Christ. And that's why we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. Now notice verse 8. The one who practices sin is of the devil. Because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. 
For this purpose, the Son of God appeared that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now notice this, verse 9. Everyone who has been begotten by God does not practice sin because his seed, that is the begettal of the Holy Spirit, is dwelling within him and he is not able to practice sin because he has been begotten by God. Okay. Now then, what does the Spirit of God in us do? When we sin, come over here to chapter 5. Let's read that, okay? Chapter 5, verse 16. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin that is not unto death, okay? Now, what is a sin unto death? That is the unpardonable sin. Okay? But if he's sinning not unto death, he shall ask, that is, you pray for him. Okay. And he, God, will give him life for those who do not sin unto death. There is a sin unto death. And that death is the second death. There is no atonement. There is no forgiveness. There is no escape. That is the lake of fire. And after the lake of fire has consumed all of the wicked, that's when Satan and the demons will be cast into outer darkness, wherever that is in the universe, and will be there forever as a perpetual witness that sin never pays. Okay? There is a sin unto death concerning that sin, I do not say that you should make any supplication to God. Okay? All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Okay? But there is that sin unto death. Let's come back here and, and see how he explains it in chapter 3. Let's read verse 8 again. The one who practices sin is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God appeared that he might destroy the works of the devil. Everyone who has been begotten by God does not practice sin because the seed of begettal is dwelling within him and he is not able to practice sin because he has been begotten by God. And that works this way. When you sin, God brings it to your attention so you can repent. Okay? That's why in the daily prayer, we are to ask God to forgive us our sins. And think about today, with all of the things that we have coming into our mind via all of the high-tech things that we have. Okay. Verse 10, by this standard are manifest the children of God and the children of the devil. So there are children of the devil who will be in the lake of fire. And there is no atonement for them. Everyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, Neither is the one who does not love his brother. Okay? So that's something we really need to know and understand. So that's the message for the Day of Atonement. That we see that God is righteous and just. He forgives us of our sins upon deep and sincere repentance but the sins of Satan the devil and the children of the devil who will not repent. Satan has his punishment forever and the children of the devil will be burned up. And then 
there is the complete atonement for all the children of God and for the beginning of the millennium so that now the family of God can grow great. So see you at the Feast of Tabernacles. And we will say, Amen. Thank you.